Okay, so this is class number three of RPH 140 World Philosophies. We are covering Plato's dialogue about with Socrates dialogue with Euthyphro. Euthyphro is a religious leader. Socrates meets him on the steps of the courthouse because Euthyphro is there because he's taking his father to court for murder. And Socrates is there because he's being taken to court for corrupting the youth and not believing in the city's gods. So the scene begins with um, Euthyphro and Socrates talking to each other about what is piety. Because when Euthyphro tells Socrates his situation, um, uh, Socrates really seriously uh, considers that he might be wrong. So here's the situation. Euthyphro, um, Euthyphro's father had a slave who was kind of a wild slave, you know, out of control. And he got drunk one day and killed another slave. So in Greek culture, slaves are property. It doesn't mean you have to abuse them. As a matter of fact, Aristotle did not advocate that at all. He had a very specific idea. I think Aristotle's view of a natural slave would be what we would call somebody with a low IQ that can live within a household and um, just needs more direction in life. Now, whether or not some people, such people exist and all that is very controversial. I would never defend it, but it's not American slavery. <laughs> that was by force, not by nature. Anyway, um, so the slave got drunk and killed another slave. Uh, Euthyphro's father did not kill that slave. That's what most people would have thought right? The slave had no rights and certainly no right to kill another slave. So, but Euthyphro's father didn't do that. He had the slave bound in a ditch and he sent a messenger to the Oracle of Delphi. And the Oracle is the place you go if you really want justice, if you want to find out what's true and what's best according to a universal theory. So you don't decide there's a higher um, insight, there's natural justice. And so his father, according to his father, would be seeking justice uh, according to nature, what really wanting to do the right thing, not just wanting to act on impulse. Before the messenger got back, the slave died. Okay, so Euthyphro has decided there's a custom in Greece that you should not share hospitality with somebody you think is evil and has evil on their hands. And so Euthyphro um, decided that he can't do this. This is impious for him to be eating, living with his father. And so he decides that the gods want him to take his father to court for murder. Socrates is very surprised and then says, wow, Euthyphro, you must know quite a bit about what the gods want. And so I should become your disciple because the Athenians have told me that I'm impious. I don't believe in the city's gods. And yet you uh, represent the, you know, you are the conduit between humans and the gods. You're trying to be set an example. And um, Euthyphro's first reaction was he's quoting from Hesiod. So the creation story in the Greek culture was that um, Gaia, the first early forces was Gaia, the earth. She gave birth to Uranus, heaven. They in turn, um, came together and gave birth to rivers and mountains and a whole lot of creatures, including some monsters that had five heads, five, ten arms. And um, Uranus 
was both uh, embarrassed by them because they were ugly and threatened by them because they were strong. Okay, and so he buried them in the earth. And so Gaia came to all the other children she had with a sickle and said, okay, who wants to cut off this guy's genitals? I'm not having any more sex with this guy. <laughs> He's dead, right? This is sex ed, according to Dr. Beck. All right, so she also had a son named Kronos, chronology, right? It means time. And he volunteered and he cut off his father's genitals and he became king of the gods. Now, and Euthyphro says, well, look, Socrates, I'm not cutting off my father's genitals. You know, I didn't do what Uranus did to his son. And then when Kronos started having kids, he got really paranoid. <laughs> One of his kids going to do that to him. And so he ate his children. And then Zeus um, swallowed. Then his mother, uh, his concubine, his wife tricked him. He ended up throwing up. And um, Zeus took over as king of the gods. So the story is about the... Um, the inability of fathers to let go of their power, they get into power struggles with their sons. And also, if you read it metaphorically, right? So Euthyphro is reading it literally. But if that's true, all the stories of the gods, right? The stories of the gods are rape and violence. The gods do all sorts of horrible things. But if you're a religious leader, and you're using a literal interpretation of the gods, you can pretty much quote anything and justify it, correct? And is that true of our Old Testament and our New Testament? There's like 150 books. There's a part where God is portrayed as merciful. Then there's God is portrayed as jealous and angry and will take revenge for seven generations. And there's the God this and the God that, right? They really, the, the biblical writers think about God differently. And a scholar will tell you, right? There's the Yahweh and the Jehovah and the Deuteronomy and the Leviticus. There's the priests and there's the prophets. And there's, it's a lot of different points of view. And the guy who wrote, there was the same guy wrote Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. And in Proverbs, things sort of made sense. And in Ecclesiastes, he just says, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. So <laughs> he even changed his mind or he had a midlife crisis or something. So, um, so the Greeks and, and I would say Christians disagree on how to interpret these texts. And they can all find quotes, right? Um, so. Um, I think I'm going to just leave it there and then I'm going to pretend I'm Euthyphro and I'm going to give Euthyphro's point of view and then I'm going to give Socrates point of view and then I want you to tell me what you think, right? Okay, so now I'm Euthyphro. All right, so I was a religious leader. I lived out in the countryside. I watched my city-state decline, all right? So we were, when we fought against the Persians, we had a golden age. And then we fought against the Spartans and it was deteriorating. Teenagers were rebelling against their parents. Um, the leaders were engaged in forming a Delian League. They were taking spoils of war to build these monuments to democracy. They were taxing their allies. They were acting in all these undemocratic ways. And I felt like as a religious leader, I have to put my foot down and I have to stand up for what's right. And I have to show the public that we still, some of us still believe in God, the gods, and we have to return to the love of the gods. And so my father did this thing and I just decided this is it because it's absolutely wrong to murder, right? 
So I had this conversation with Socrates and um, he didn't, he didn't right away agree with me, right? Which is fine. Socrates had a reputation for forcing people to think through their ideas. But okay, he asked me, what is piety? Well, obviously piety is doing what I'm doing, which is prosecuting bad people. Um, and then Socrates asked, well, do humans disagree on who's bad and who's good? Well, yeah. What about the gods? Do the gods, but no, it's what the gods want that's pious, not necessarily human. Well, Socrates said, do the gods disagree? <laughs> well, yeah, but in this case, what's pious is what all the gods agree on. And my case, I know that all the gods would agree. And then Socrates said, well, we know that humans disagree on who is a murderer, right? If an abused wife finally loses her mind and ends up killing an abuser, is she murdering in cold blood or is she a murderer? Should she have to go to prison? That's one disagreement, right? Is someone who gets in an early stage abortion, are they a murderer? Another disagreement, all in the name of God, right? And so, um, so Socrates asked me that. All we know is that the gods disagree on a lot of things. People disagree on a lot of things. People disagree on who the a murderer is. So why don't you explain to me why the gods wouldn't disagree on whether your dad is a murderer? Does that make sense? It made sense to me, but I knew I could explain it to Socrates. Um, I just didn't have time. But Socrates sort of changed the subject at that point. And he said, is something holy or pious because the gods love it or do the gods love it because it's holy or pious? All right, I'm going to make you all vote on that question. And then I'm gonna make you defend your answer to that question. All right, you want me to give you the question again? Is something righteous or holy or pious because the gods love it? Or do the gods love it because it's holy or pious or righteous, okay? What's the cause and what's the effect? And Socrates points that out, right? There is the carrying and being carried, right? Okay, Jack, what do you say? I say it's pious because the gods decide it's pious. Okay, why? Um, I think they kind of set like the rules and like regulations to like what is what is right and what is wrong. Okay, if you thought that and you wanted to be pious, what would you spend your life doing? Mm, probably studying the teachings of the gods. Very good. You'd memorize the stories, right? So that you could apply them in situations. You'd live the way Euthyphro lives. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Uh, what about you, Alex? Um, I guess my idea of gods, especially like Greek and Roman gods are a little bit more human especially because the their stories are very um weird they don't make the most righteous de decisions um so i think that the gods like an like an action because it is pious it is a good moral decision okay. so you go the other way yes, the gods love because it is pious and right. If you thought that, how would you live your life? Um, 
I think, like, I don't know. Um, I guess it would be more like my own personal ideas of what is right and wrong. So and you keep asking yourself, what is? Yeah, there's, there's obviously never a stop to that question. And um, when it comes down to it, I guess like I'll meet my my doom at the end. Okay. How does Socrates live his life? What's he doing? He's asking. He's always, me. yeah. <laughs> okay. Does everybody get that? The different way you answer it, two different ways of life based on the answer to that question. What about you, Michael? Um, I agree with Alex. I think that um, God loves it because it is pious, okay. but not that God makes it pious. Okay, so that would be the difference between a fundamentalist, right, who says every word in the Bible is inspired by God, right? And so if you can quote from it, from the Bible, it has some kind of legitimacy. Um, that other texts or whatever just don't have. Whereas if you're thinking the gods love it because it's pious, then you don't have any uh, particular book or particular story. You're having to, you're trying to find natural piety, which is what the oracle at Delph Delphi represented a universal standard. And so then you have to be constantly asking questions and uh, reading about what people have done in the past, uh, figuring out if texts are written as metaphors, allegories to try and educate us about what not to do, <laughs> as opposed to literal coaching about how we should live as, or as just descriptions of how people do live, or some of the people in the people in Euthyphro's family had actually thought the way they read the stories, well, the gods are powerful, they can do whatever they want, but the rest of us can't, right? So yeah, gods can kill innocent people, but we can't. Um, all right, so that's a more literal interpretation. Anyway, the point here is that that's a watershed question. And then how do you want to live, right? Do you want piety, holiness, humility, some kind of recognition of higher powers to be part of your life? And if you do, do you pick a certain tradition and read its holy books and you know memorize them? Or do you just try to glean insights from all sorts of sources, from your experience, from history? Does everybody understand that? That's and so this is a very, Plato is so much the foundation for liberal arts education because all it tells you is you have a free mind. You decide what kind of questions you want to keep asking yourself the rest of your life. This is one of the serious questions. It's a dialectical question. It will never get absolutely answered, although some people will think it does, right? There will always be people who think it was a black and white decision on that one. It was a black and white decision on that one. And they will never realize, right, that somebody else could think about it a different way. And that's, Euthyphro was like that. He was that kind of a black and white thinker. Um, okay, so then after that, Euthyphro says piety is... Um, waiting on the gods, serving the gods, right? Okay, that's good, legit. Um, so what's the difference between piety and justice, right? Socrates suggests that justice is a broader care, uh, quality. So reverence, all examples of reverence are kind of justice, but not all justice is a kind of reverence or piety. Does everybody understand that? You know, justice can be um, 
condemning a murderer to prison without any question of religion, right? Just you killed somebody, we got to protect ourselves, keep God out of it. Okay, so there's just secular justice laws. And then there's the stuff that relates to the gods, to our relation to the gods. So then Euthyphro says, okay, justice is our relationships to humans and piety is our relation to the gods. Oh, good. Socrates says, good answer, right? Well, what is our service to the gods, right? What is the nature of this relationship? It's certainly different than your relation to your friend. There's your friend right in front of your face, right? The gods are sort of in your mind. Um, so then Socrates uh, compares it to master-slave, or either for a master-slave, right? Is it the kind of service a master gives to a slave or a slave gives to a master, right? We are, we are God's servants. You, you guys have heard that, right? We are servants, okay. Well, Socrates says, well, what about that? Does the servant um, need the master or does the master need the servant? Oops, <laughs> right? The servant doesn't need to wait on the master. The master needs someone to wait on him so he can do more important work, right? So Euthyphro goes, wait, wait, didn't mean that. Um, and then, um, so the next thing was comparing that, the analogy. So this kind of education is all about analogies. That's why I have lots of news articles because there are things that I found over the years that I thought had analogies, but I also like students to bring their own because again, this is the way you learn to think dialectically. You think about that dialogue and then you, something happens around you and you go, oh my God, I think there's a, an analogy there, right? Someone else will say, no, I don't think it's quite the same. And in this way it is, in this way it isn't. That's, that's the education. So he says, is it like the service that doctors give to medicine, right? Does the doctor serve the art of medicine? Now I'm gonna ask you to answer this. So uh, listen up. Does the doctor serve the art of medicine? Or does medicine serve the art of the doctor to produce health, right? What about the shipbuilder? Does the shipbuilder um, serve the art of shipbuilding? Or does the ship art of shipbuilding serve the shipbuilder to produce a ship? What do you guys think and why? Okay, Michael. Does the doctor serve the art of medicine or does the art of medicine serve the doctor? And why would you pick one rather than the other? Um, I think I think I would say that the doctor serves the art of medicine because I feel that the like if it was kind of like a hi hierarchy, um, that the art of medicine would come above the doctor, um, and that the doctor, <clears throat> the doctor is kind of like doing what the art of medicine says we should do. If that's a makes servant, sense. right? Right. He serves the art to produce health. Uh, what about you, Alex? I um, think the opposite. Okay. I think, yeah, I think the art of medicine serves the doctor um, because the only way the art of medicine could be furthered is through the doctor or it, the only way it can also be administered is through the doctor. Okay. Okay, Jack. We don't go by majority rule, but this time we can't just take a vote to get the truth, which Socrates brings up a number of times in dialogue. But here you are, you gotta break the tie. Um, I think the the dark or the the doctor um uses the utilizes the art of medicine i think he goes by like the teachings 
because I don't think without the teachings that he would have any idea or he or she would have any idea what to do. Okay. So, um, okay, so Alex, I think you have a really good answer, but what I think this is getting to is it's referring to every skill that people have in a society. So the shipbuilder are all those business kind of things, right? Where it the, the goal is to create this product outside of the person. It's a physical product. So the shipbuilder example is every craft related to business, like shoemaking, you name it, right? The doctor is an internal physical goal, health, right? Then what is it that piety is intended to produce? Okay, Jack, what, what does, you know, worshiping gods or anything like that produce? Um, like individually or as a society? Answer it how you like. <laughs> Personally, I think religion serves as like a sense of security. Okay. Or like a set of like rules that you can follow to kind of evaluate yourself in a certain way, if you're religious, that is. Okay. Um, okay, as a guide, like Alex said, right? Yeah. Instead of a person, though, it's a set of rules. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Um, what about you, Alex? What do you think piety produces? So, Jack, would you say the goal is a healthier soul? Mm -hmm. It's a state of soul, right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think piety gives us some sort of um, integrity because if you believe that at the end of the, your life, you're going to be judged, you're going to be more likely to do the better thing. Okay. Okay. It'll, it'll rein in your impulses. Um, okay. It'll give you self-control, right? Yes. Okay. Because that would be based on fear, right? Fear of punishment? A little bit, um, yeah. Okay. What about you, Michael? What do you think piety produces? Yeah, so I was going to say it kind of functions like... Um, a kind of like a system of like checks and balances like that is what you're like putting in so that you like if you are religious that is what you are putting in so that you can you know feel that you are doing your your part for said religion okay um but at the same time like you guys just said it keeps you uh kind of like accountable i guess okay now so you, I think you can say that ships, there's an external object. Medicine, it's the physical health. Piety, it's psychological health of some kind. Does that make sense? Um, and the issue here, I think what he's getting at is does the shoemaker serve the art to produce shoes? Or does the art serve him? And if the art serves him, what else might the shoemaker use the art for? If he's in control, he could use it to get rich, right? Does that make sense? If the art of medicine serves the doctor, ha. Huh, he can use it to get status, to get power, to get money. It can be corrupted. Does that make sense? And that was what was happening in Athens, is that people would make worse products or they'd overcharge because they could, right? If you're the only shoemaker in town, you can wrap the people around you for greed or status. Um, 
And you don't, you know, where the money is, is with Italian high heeled shoes that wreck people's feet. There's no money in those boring, ugly, healthy shoes that keep people's feet. <laughs> right? What about doctors? Is there any money in keeping people healthy? No, I mean, get them sick and then you make a lot of money, right? So the heart disease doctors make three times more than the wellness family doctors, right? And so what's happening is that people are using their talent, skills, the whole educational system to serve their own irrational desires. They're taking advantage of their freedom to choose what they want to do and how they want to do it. And that was a big corrupting influence in Athens. <laughs> Do you think it's an influence in our society? <laughs> when you guys are deciding on your major and your career, are you going to serve that art, you know, for its natural purpose? Or are you going to wrap it around you so you can make money and power? Like, what is your goal in going into this field, right? That's an open question, but I think, again, these dialogues are designed to get kid, uh, young people who are making decisions think about, well, what do you want? And if you do use it to wrap, you know, to get rich and power, you're going to destabilize your society because you're going to shrink the middle class. You're going to make life harder. You're going to create resentments. Um, anyway, so... So that was the next step. And then the next step, the next part of the argument was what was the nature of the, I gotta make sure I get these in the right order. Um, number five. Oh yeah, okay, we are down to number five. Then he says, piety is learning how to please the gods in words and deed by prayer and sacrifice. This is piety, which is the salvation of families and states. And impiety is unpleasing to the gods and it ruins societies. Okay. And then uh, Socrates says, gee, that sounds like a business deal with God, right? I'll scratch your back, you scratch my back. Have you ever heard the expression, families who pray together stay together? It's a deal. Right? Uh, do people ever think like that? Do they ever, you know, if somebody suffers unjustly, they think, I don't deserve this because I've been a good person, right? That's a deal. <laughs> were you doing it because you were said, I scratch God's back, I get something in return? Does that make sense to you that it can, it can devolve into a business deal? So really, it's just self-interest magnified into some sort of cosmic <laughs> um, meaning. And it, it's just kind of a business deal with the gods. Why is that important? Because Euthyphro thought that what he was doing was going to set a better example and help turn the, that area of Greece, the Athens, around back back to God, right? America returned to God. Uh, Jerry Falwell thought that after 9-11. Um, and Socrates was pretty worried about that because he thought, no, this could just as easily become more a part of the empire building because then people are gonna start condemning, you know, so Socrates, so I'll act like Socrates, I myself read these stories metaphorically, and that's why I'm getting taken to court for not believing in the city's gods, right? So Euthyphro is this literalist black and white thinker. He likes me, but it's his same mentality that Meletus has. That's why I'm being condemned for being you know, impious and corrupting the youth, because I don't take it literally, because I think you do have to something, you're going to please the gods if you find out what righteousness is, 
and you develop your mind because the gods gave us minds to think critically about this so we don't lie to ourselves that we're more pious than we think we are just because we believe we are. And also, you can present yourself to the public. You can manipulate people as pious if you just go through the motions. But if you want to have a democracy, you have to think critically about this. It's not black and white. You have to keep re-examining. And Euthyphro is just a black and white thinker. And some people who read the dialogue think he's really arrogant. Other people think he's really pious. And Socrates thinks, I don't know, you know, I don't know. And I don't know what, sometimes somebody will go out on a limb and do something like this. How is he going to think about it later on, five years from now? Ten, is he going to regret this? Or is he going to think this really made him a great religious leader and he will just move forward with his black and white thinking? Um, does everybody understand that? that these things are really fluid. And that's why you have to keep asking. Now, that's why, I, now all these examples, um, and hopefully you can think of some examples also, but you know that there are many examples, um, mega churches, right? After 9-11, all these mega churches were built. Well, is that to prove how pious we are? Or is that to be part of empire building? Okay, our God's bigger than your God. And I'll tell you because we got all this money, right? And so, you know, Joel Ornstein, prosperity gospel, you're rich because God loves you and favors us. That's why America, that's why God loves America is because we're rich. Not because we exploited other people and we exploit God's creation. No, no, <laughs> we're different. America is exceptional because, and that's, and the fact that we're rich is God's blessing. And so we're going to build these mega churches just to stick it to everybody, just to stick it to those Muslims, right? Or do people go to church because they're pious or to network with other rich people and get a better job? Uh, yeah. What about capital punishment? Somebody says it's against God's will. Somebody says it's definitely God wants punishment. It's black and white. What about abortion? What about if abortion were illegal? And if it is killing of innocent life, and if you think people who kill innocent life should get capital punishment, what happens if you, you really, your daughter runs away and he has this awful boyfriend and, and she just ends up being gone for five days or something. And you really suspect her of having gotten an abortion. And if it's illegal, it's killing innocent life, she should get the electric chair. So if a parent takes her daughter to court and, and with the expectation she would get capital punishment, would everybody say, wow, what a religious, those people really love God. Is that what everybody would say? <laughs> what do you think most people would say? No. They'd say she's heartless, or they'd say, I mean, they might say, maybe I would go to hell, but I would never take my daughter, you know? right? To the electric chair. Send me to hell, God. I'm not doing that to my kid. I don't know, but I know it would be controversial, right? Well, I mean, it's possible in Texas right now. I, you know, it's hard for me to follow, but I think so. If your daughter, you suspect her, at least the way the law is written, you can get $10,000 for bringing her in, right? So do you think people, let's just assume that that did pass and that goes through and it's being enforced. Would everybody think, wow, those parents are really pious? Or would they think, my God, you make 10,000 bucks by you know, bringing your daughter into giving her a, a criminal record? What do you think people would say? 
What would you say? Would there still be a punishment for the daughter? Well, I mean, let's just say the parents, we're going to, we think it's wrong and we're going to do this. And then the courts take it from there, but we're not going to let this go. I think it's greedy. <laughs> Some people would think it's greed, right? They just would. Other people would think it's incredibly heartless and unforgiving. Some people would think, wait, God is merciful. But other people would think, no, that's right. That's the Bible. You don't kill, you know, right? Does everybody understand there would be a lot of disagreement? I think there would be a lot of disagreement. Um, there certainly is now. What about a child dies of sins? Is that God's will? What do you guys think? Okay. I think that's how religious people explain it. All religious people? Um, Christian. I think Christian people would, would explain it that way. Okay. Um, actually, there's mainline churches that unite reason and faith. They don't. And then there's churches that split reason from faith. And I don't know. I Some of them definitely do. I don't know if it's universally agreed on. I had one student years ago, his dad had been a Baptist preacher and his wife got cancer and died when my student was in high school. And people all said it was God's will. And he left the Baptist church and became a Methodist minister <laughs> um, because the Methodists don't say stuff like that. They just think science is the cause, not God. Um, so we know that Christian science deny children medical care, but we also know in the name of God now, people are denying themselves and other people the vaccine. Of course, we disagree a lot, right? Americans disagree a lot about what God would want in terms of getting vaccinated. Everybody disagreed about whether we should go into Iran, Iraq or whether we should have a first strike military policy whether we should have programs that lift up the poor. I mean, there's huge disagreements in the name of God. So let me go through this one. Um, uh, we're just gonna go a little longer, I'm sorry. This one was, I thought that I didn't make business deals with the gods, right? That I didn't think like that. And what my best friend from high school, one of my two, three best friends, had had a crush on Danny since she was in kindergarten. She told her mom, I'm gonna marry Danny. So she married Danny and they had these three kids. And the Hulster generation had not had a daughter for three generations. So their third kid was this little girl named Hannah. Hannah died of SIDS. Okay, so this is my high school friend. And that my first reaction was, well, not them. <laughs> <laughs> they're a happy family like ah <laughs> but that was me doing a business deal right does everybody get that like why not them okay so then I have another story <laughs> my son right everybody loves my son and his wife they do inner city education I mean I realize I'm his mother but really <laughs> a lot of people they're stellar citizens my son gets cancer at age 40. I know what people were thinking. Not them. <laughs> God, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> you know? And um, I mean, I don't think that way. And my son doesn't think that way. But, but again, and I didn't even have that immediate reaction because I had sort of grown out of it. But a lot of people did, including, I'm sure, his in-laws who were from Mexico. They live in Guadalajara. But he, he ended up getting surgery, getting over it and all that. But anyway, that's the idea that we don't think we're making business deals, but we really have to be careful about that. And then this one is that you shouldn't politicize religion because people on both sides of any political um, uh, divide just disagree, right? 
once side things poverty programs are what God wants us to do. Use our minds, lift people up out of poverty and environmental. Uh, we shouldn't destroy God's creation. We shouldn't unilaterally uh, attack another country. We shouldn't arm for war. We shouldn't, um, we shouldn't uh, lie, right, it, for political purposes. Um, and we should treat people equally, no matter what religion there are, right? That, that would be the liberals. And then the conservatives, um, the liberals think that punishment should be rehabilitative. The conservatives, it should be punitive. The liberals think you should get people job skills and when they get out of prison, give them better housing and jobs so they can get on their feet. The conservatives think, nope, they lost all their rights. They got to figure it out. Um, all right. And then this is a humanist manifesto. So this is an idea of what things you can believe without God, right? And then Noah is, um, I, I don't know if you had time to read this, but it was another interpretation. Noah got drunk <laughs> before he started to like get his act together. And so uh, the reason I have these articles is because it really mattered what happened after 9-11. There was a window of opportunity for us to start building bridges with other countries and to start realizing that we came across as arrogant and to think about our policies toward the Mideast. And if I knew we were going to get attacked because of our attitudes and that they have billions of dollars from oil. I, this didn't surprise me at all, but nobody asked me. <laughs> um, and I thought we should go through a much more rigorous examination process, but this is where uh, Billy Graham's son, it's just been anti-Muslim all the way down, right? And it's still there. There's still Islamophobia. Uh, Donald Trump banned visitors, banned anyone from seven different Muslim countries from coming to our country. Do you all know that? That one of the first things he did was he banned terrorists, people coming from these terrorist countries. So he really fanned the flames of Islamophobia. Um, how many terrorists came from those countries? Does anybody know? There's seven countries, Syria, uh, I don't know, Yemen, I can't remember what seven, but how many terrorists had actually come from those countries? Guess, Jack, guess. Uh, I think the majority were from Saudi Arabia, right? 17 out of 19. How come we didn't ban them? Because- they have oil. Yeah, H.W. Bush had 10 million bucks invested in stock, right? And, and that was years ago. So of course, our, the rich people in our country are made much richer because of their investments in Saudi oil, right? And uh, Trump made friends with the Saudis and uh, Jared Kushner was buddies, even though they killed one of our uh, journalists. So... <laughs> Yeah, um, the, another irony is that Syria was banned and Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple, his parents immigrated from Syria. <laughs> I mean, that's anecdotal, right? But there weren't any terrorists. So we had that opportunity. So I do think it's important for you to know we had a choice. We could have become more humble and we could have connected with um, our allies. We could have isolated the terrorists. We could have connected with countries that wanted these terrorists isolated, but we didn't. We stonewalled it, uh, my way or the highway. We alienated ourselves from our allies and our enemies. And then we took revenge, right? And just like in a Greek tragedy, it, they're always telling you, don't take revenge. Now we've spent, I think, two trillion bucks 
that the war was sold to us that it would pay for itself in six months because we get cheap oil. It's cost us, I think, one and a half trillion bucks, okay? And people in the know knew that. And there are way more Al-Qaeda in Iraq. There weren't any Al-Qaeda in Iraq at the time because Saddam uh, had kept them out. But the real motive was money. The people behind are going in there wanted to set up 134 military bases so we could get cheap oil. And that's all in, in writing. And the American public didn't know that and they still don't know that. Um, Matthew Dowd is actually running, I think for governor of Texas or Senator, I'm not quite sure. I think governor, actually he's running for governor of Texas. And he gets interviewed periodically on the, the site that I look at. And he was, um, I mean, it's an interesting story. He was Democrat, he got disillusioned. He went with W. Bush. He helped Bush win by telling Northerners how to, what you have to tell Southerners so they'll vote Republican. He was very successful at that and then he regretted it um, because he saw that they weren't going to um, be generous. Uh, w. Bush ran on a compassionate conservative platform he was um, going to give gay people um, civil unions, and his wife came out uh, against overturning Roe versus Wade. That was before 9-11. Then the party restructured itself, and now we've got what we've got. But it was always in the name of religion. That's the point that I want to emphasize to you, that religion was used to justify a whole lot of things and um, a war and uh, uh, a party, a political party started identifying as Christian. So it was the polit politicization of religion in a way that our founders did not want. They did not want an official state religion, um, but we still have that. The, all these things are lingering, um, but I thought, did each of you, I just want to ask each of you if you came up with an example today of how disagreements about what God wants are alive and well in our society, which examples stuck out to you? Um, let's see, Alex, you can start. Sorry, what was the question? What can, did you think of some examples? where people disagree about what's pious or impious. Anyway, I'll, I'll let Jack, I'll start with Jack. You can think about it. Or Michael, do you have one, Michael? Uh, I mean, you've already mentioned abortion, uh, but what I was gonna bring up was, um, uh, which you've also mentioned a couple of times, but just like uh, LGBTQ like rights in general, um, they're pretty, pretty readily tied with um, religion, holiness, etc. Um, however, it also breeds like hypocrisy within religious people um, with, within the ways that they've treated those people as well. Uh, so actually that was in 2004 election, focus groups had been constructed and people asked, you know, would you vote on the basis of this? What is it that you're thinking about? And so on the basis of fo focus group research, they decided they could win the election by being anti-gay. And so they put, there were 11 states that came within four points and they put a marriage amendment on every one of those states ballots. Arkansas was one of them. And every single one of them went red. And Dick Cheney, who was one of the strategists, he has a gay daughter who's very close to, she was head of his uh, political campaign. And so I want you to tell me which one, what do you think he said to her when this whole campaign is anti-gay? Do you think he said to her, well, Mary, yes, I have really thought that was perverse. Or did he say to her, those damn idiots, they don't get it. And politics is dirty. And sometimes you have to do stuff you don't wanna do. Okay, how many of you think 
he finally admitted to his daughter that, Mary, I've always thought you were a pervert. How many of you thought, eh, politics is dirty and he's just cynical and you have to punch these people's buttons because they're stupid? How many of you think that's what he was thinking? Well, yes, I think that um, he did like set aside like this is politics. I don't hate you. But there is also that saying where um, hate the sin, but not the sinner. So um, he, he would have loved his daughter, um, but still not really appreciated the fact that she was gay. Like he was able to like block that out, I guess. Okay, well, then there's another story of his, his other daughter when she's running for senator of Wyoming. She didn't say anything about her daughter, her sister, but then the, the campaign was really close, or she was way behind. So she said, I've always thought, I've always had serious questions about my sister's sexuality, and she won. But her parents said, we've never had any problem. Okay, guys, <laughs> I do think you should be aware that you have to be careful about getting jerked around, right? And that's why you read the euthyphro. It's just you have to be careful um, because religion can get used by people whose real motive is money and empire building. Does everybody understand that? And that isn't just from reading medieval history or something. That happens now. Um, Jack, did you think of an example? Well, I think abortion's a pretty hot topic right now. About right. What people think is religious. Like um, if say somebody got raped, I, I don't I don't think Christians really like contemplate how, what they would what they would do in that situation. Okay. Um, yeah, so what, I mean, have any of you had an experience where somebody really thinks it's absolutely wrong and then somebody they know gets pregnant, maybe them, maybe rape or incest, and all of a sudden all bets are off. Have, I mean, does that make sense to you? People who work in these clinics say every week we get in at least one woman who's been in these demonstrations or who works for anti-abortion, right? And that's, that's not necessarily, that's not hypocrisy. It's panic. People panic when they get pregnant. Does that make sense? And they didn't intend to ever be in the situation. So the other thing about it that's interesting is that the man who was basically the grandfather of our founding fathers, whose book, The Second Treatise on Government, is the bite is was basically lifted from to make our Declaration of Independence. Like Nowadays, if you hadn't put a footnote, John Locke's treatise of government, you would get sent to the provost, you'd get an F for the class. <laughs> so he literally took all these ideas. John Locke said that a fetus in a mother's womb is like a vegetable, all right? But he also said that you must believe in the immortality of the soul. But he also wrote a whole letter saying you have to separate your duties as a citizen from your, do, your religious beliefs. And he wrote this long, long letter where every single possible argument for uniting church and state at his time, he refutes it, right? So here we go. We, we were handed a huge contradiction on that issue. Does that make sense to everyone? That it was contradictory from the start and it just gets our founding fathers didn't even know abortions were ha happening probably they were happening right they just didn't they're out to lunch <laughs> and so anyway it's controversial for a lot of reasons but I think 
Um, I don't think anyone thinks it's their religious duty to get an abortion, but mostly they think people should be able to make their own choice and then live with the consequences. Does that make sense to the rest of you? I mean, I to me, I can picture a woman, or I've actually heard the testimony of a woman who was abused. She was so mad at her dad, this predatory guy who was an abuser, you can smell there's a predatory prey thing. He tells her he loves her. So he, you know, she runs off. She says, hey, dad, I'm out of here. And her dad says, it's going to be even worse. So, okay, she marries this guy. He has a stepdaughter. The, the guy not only rapes her, but he brings his friends in to gang rape her. But she doesn't say anything because of the stepdaughter. And so she puts up with it because she wouldn't get custody of the stepdaughter. Okay, so if she got pregnant, as far as I'm concerned, like she should be able to make a decision because on her point of view, this child doesn't have a chance to have a decent life, right? And is so likely to end up doing something that they're gonna roast in hell for. I'd rather roast in hell for getting an abortion than to bring a child into this situation. Like I'm willing to take that because I'm not gonna put a kid in this. Does that make sense to the rest of you that it's just very complicated? It's not black and white. And the way our constitution is written, again, it's interpretation of the constitution. Obviously, we're gonna probably, you know, have it changed. But it seems to me that, for me, the big issue is how to have the fewest number of abortions with an S. Does everybody understand that? As a matter of public policy, let's try to have the fewest number of abortions. I know because I was in high school when it got changed in college, there were more abortions before it got passed. Because once it got passed, if you have teenage sex ed, if you have availability of contraceptions, you have fewer abortions. And if you have poverty programs, because women get abortions because they're too poor or because they already have kids and they know what, how hard it is how much time they'd have to take off. They have these other kids, they gotta have a job. They're literally, it's impossible situation. Or, they, or they, um, they're not ready, they're too young. That's why they get, they're too poor, they're too young, or they have too many other responsibilities. That's why they get them. Not because, oh, it's just another kind of birth control. So the, it's much, better to have fewer abortions to have keep it legal have teen sex ed have contraceptions available um and emphasize prevention and planned parenthood as a matter of fact does more to prevent abortions than the number of abortions it has okay but that that never gets out into the public eye right so you can ask yourself, really, is it a matter of principle? We just can't have this legal. Because I know some Lyon graduates, someone told me, why are there so many school shootings? Why do we have all these shootings? Because when we made abortion legal, we lost all our value for human life. So that's the cause. So if we make abortion illegal, we won't have so many shootings. How many of you think that? What do you think, Jack? Uh, I think that's a, I think that's a bad analogy. Or it's a bad cause effect, right? Yeah. It's yeah. like, it's not rooted in any data, right? There's no evidence of that. The way you have fewer abortions is teenage sex ed 
and contraception, right? Does that make sense? So anyway, that's just one example of how people deliberate about an issue differently and deliberating about it as a citizen should be similar and different than deliberating about it as a religious believer. But if you start to make, you know, link religion to the state, then you start to get authoritarianism because religious leaders can say anything and call it God's will. And political leaders can do whatever they want and call it God's will. And that's what our founders did not want because that's what went on in Europe, right? The Pope said, God wants this crusade or the king said, nope, the church wants me to invade, blah, blah, right? Does everybody understand that? Um, are there any other questions? Okay, so this, does it make sense that this was kind of a cheat sheet idea of lots of ideas connected to that question, what is piety? And in order to preserve a democracy, you have to keep thinking about it or certain answers are gonna drive you toward authoritarianism and away from democracy. So you have to just keep re-examining it and not decide black and white. And then a politician will take advantage of that and use that to gain power and wealth. Um, all right, so the next class is about Socrates defending his way of life. And so you have to vote. Do you think he's guilty or not of corrupting the youth and not believing in the city's gods? And you have to have your arguments. And um, I don't know, it's such a privilege to teach this. This is the cornerstone of traditional liberal arts education, right? It doesn't get more <laughs> cornerstone-y than, so than Plato's Apology. And it's been such an honor for me to be able to teach it over the decades. Um, okay, take care. Now you put a post on by Friday af afternoon. Everybody understand the post thing? Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you all for contributing. Uh, have a nice whatever five days till Sunday night. <laughs>